Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could teach the gullible to never be so comfortable with eyes they eat like comfort food? To disregard the bogus claims and pseudo-scientific claims, can you imagine just how much indeed the world would change? No more political predators playing on the populace with ilkas and plots to shift and kill metropolis. No more villains with the title in the Bible holding phony temper writers like the stuff they teach is vital. Imagine it was normal to have to prove a claim to make. The folks really feel ashamed of pressing content that was fake. It's not to say we never make mistakes, it's just to say we go out of our way to show the evidence it takes. Remain skeptical while you travel the world or even stay trapped. We're allowed to get fast. That's what it is, yo. Yeah. Keep reality intact. Yeah. Yeah. Help the truth grow. Uh-huh. Question every claim, especially the ones you believe in. Remain skeptical while you travel the world or reason. Winning show, Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century. I'm your host, Sarah Levin, and my co-host is and, um, David Tamayo. David Tamayo from Hispanic American Freethinkers. Very happy to be here. That song gets better every time, or it's, it's a new? I don't know. I was getting into it. I, uh, it was really good. Anyway, I need, I need to see if I can get a little recording of it. <laughs> Played in my car as I drive to work every day. Okay, so to move into our topic today, uh, the Pew Research Center did a survey last November uh, showing that of the 390 million people in Latin America, the number of atheists is at an all-time high of 60 million. In 1970, 92% of Latin Americans identified as Catholic, but today that has dropped to 69% and continues to fall. Today we'll be exploring uh, some of the reasons for this trend, and we will have two guests via Skype. We will have Arturo Ruiz, directly from Santiago, Chile, and Doin Solar, connecting directly from Puerto Rico. Uh, these two gentlemen are secular activists uh, who will give us a closer look um, uh, about religion and atheism and secularism in those specific regions of Latin America. And we'll talk a little bit about as to why we picked those two countries. And uh, also, um, well, before we, mo- before we move further, uh, maybe we should do the things we were ordered to do. So <clears throat> one of those things we were ordered to do is uh, I got to tell you a joke, and um, I'll give you uh, 20 bucks if you laugh. Okay. Uh, so did you hear about the, uh, the microbiologist that visited 30 countries, and he speaks six languages? No. Well, he's a man of many cultures. <laughs> I think I owe you twenty dollars. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, hey, we we had to do this. This is the best. Jo- Look, I'm wearing even the science. Uh, you know, the, the double helix, one of my favorite shapes in the, in in the world. So uh, I think the joke goes well with that. Uh, it does. With the well tie. Done. Well done. So <laughs> we'll, we'll see how how that goes. But uh, uh, it is also Women History Month, isn't it? Yes, March is Women's History Month, um, and we have chosen a free thinker of the week to go with uh, the theme of Women's History Month. Her name is Adriana Hegai from Uruguay. Uh, she's a scientist working in the field of human genomics and genetics. She's a co-founder of the website atheistuniverse.net and she will be speaking at the upcoming Pennsylvania Atheist Conference in September. So let me tell you a little bit why I think she's such a great person. Uh, a lot of times, especially women, are told that if you want to have a family life and you want to have a uh, career and you want to have uh, activities, etc curricular activities such as a website and run this thing, that you can't have it all. You have to pick something. Adriana, uh, Dr. Hegai, is an excellent, excellent example of this. Uh, She's a Latina that lives in New York and does research, uh, very advanced research in genetics. She has great family life. I've met, you know, some some of uh, her family members. I've uh, met with her uh, on occasion before and interviewed her. She's greatly admired in the field and uh, she's very active in, in social justice and and in trying to make sure that atheists get equality under the law. Mm-hmm. And, and she provides this forum at, uh, at um, uh, atheistuniverse.net to, for people to express themselves and feel that they have others that they can talk to. Mm-hmm. So this is a, a woman that I think is going to be making history. She's already making history, and I think is the perfect person considering the topic of Latin America today. That's right. And, uh, and now we'll talk a little bit about as to why we're picking Latin America also and, and that influence, but maybe we can go through... Uh, What's next? Uh, some, uh, we have a, a few additional announcements. Um, ex- it was exclusively here in Road to Reason that David Silverman recently announced that Reason Rally number two is taking place next year. Uh, the exact date is still being worked out uh, due to National Park Service rules, which don't allow reservations of the mall to be done too far in advance. Um, but this is a perfect opportunity to start uh, watching that. So if you're planning to go to Reason Rally, uh, keep an eye on that for the date to be announced. And you know, Reason Rally last time was in 2012. 
we had uh, about 20, 25,000 people that showed up. And the weather was lousy, it was raining and pouring and you know, it was miserable, but there were lots of great speakers, lots of wonderful uh, uh, activities, meeting all, first time ever that thousands and thousands of non-believers were there in, in person meeting each other. So people came from all over. This time they're expecting to have even far greater, uh, maybe 50,000 if, if everything goes well. So we're hoping that if you didn't come last time, that you make plans, start making that road trip, get together with a bunch of friends, start saving some money, and uh, there's going to be a lot of information coming, a lot of details very soon, so uh, in, in very short notice. So you need to make sure that you start saving now and start making plans. I know that some of the universalist churches in the area uh, are, we're talking about seeing if they can provide some space for people with some sleeping bags, especially students and people that can't, don't, you know, can't afford to pay for a hotel to be able to have a place to stay. But it's going to be awesome. It's going to be a lot better than last time because this time we ordered better weather than we did last time. <laughs> so we're going to have, we're going to have a, lot, a lot of better weather. So uh, that's it. The other thing that uh, I want to mention is that um, uh, Scientology is one of those things that is being kept very secret and very uh, protected and people that have gone against Scientology get sued and uh, destroyed. But HBO next week is having an expose on uh, Scientology and it's going to be fantastic. It's going to be great and uh, they've, from what I understand, they had a battery of like 130 lawyers that have looked at everything to make sure that everything that they're putting in is absolutely correct, that there's no misunderstanding standing or anything and Road to Reason is going to have the preview here. We're going to be doing a show here that is going to prepare you for this. This is the pre-game thing <laughs> and it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be good. So you make sure you tune in next week because nothing, this station has never seen anything like it and the world has never seen anything like it before. So you know something to, that, that we need to be aware of. Yes, definitely. All right, uh, one last uh, announcement uh, and this goes every week is this is, you know, Fairfax Public Television, and uh, they live from donations. Please be generous. Uh, you know, send your donations to the station. It's tax deductible. Uh, so, you know, you either give your taxes to Uncle Sam or you choose a charity to give it to. And uh, this station has been really good to secular people like us that to give us a forum and a place where we can talk uh, to you and, and bring this uh, to you uh, live every, uh, every week. So thank you very much. I hope you, you write a big check uh, and, uh, you know, peace your, your guilty conscience for getting this great television for free for so long. Okay. Right. So, and it's about time to move into some news and updates uh, that have happened this past week. Um, in Oklahoma, HB 1125 uh, passed the House. Uh, this would basically take the state out of uh, marriage licensing. Uh, so it would allow only judges, retired judges, and members of the clergy to issue marriage licenses. Um, and this is basically the legislature's attempt to uh, fight back with uh, uh, same-sex marriage uh, being legalized. Um, and the funny thing is, uh, the way they're going about it is actually going to make it easier for um, LGBT people to marry uh, because uh, now what people are doing is a bunch of members of the LGBT community are just signing up and registering to be clergy, which is apparently very easy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> taking the state out of the equation actually makes it easier, but it actually makes it harder for atheists. Yes. Um, so now, because county clerks are taken out, um, you have to find a judge that's willing to marry you. Um, yeah. And those might and be farm. I'm sure. Between. Well, you know, it's funny because it's the opposite of separation of church and state. They're pushing and suing to get the churches involved in issuing marriage licenses. And taking the state out of it completely. And, and really, marriage is, a, is, is really a contract. It's a, it's a social contract that you have with another person so that if that someone passes away, if someone, you know, you split the earnings, the support, you're working as a team uh, for, you know, a life. And if that team gets dissolved, you want to have their certain rights that marriage brings to that. Same for children. And uh, what this is doing is, is getting the churches involved even further when in fact the reason we have these issues and problems, the only reason anyone is typically against same-sex marriage is religion. Without mm -hmm. religion there's really no other, because what two people, two people, two gay people getting together and getting married doesn't affect anyone else right. at all. So silly, mm -hmm. silly. So that, that passed the House um, earlier this month and it's moving to the Senate um, and it's definitely something to watch. Uh, the author of the bill represents 
Representative Todd Russ uh, pledged to, quote, stand for godly values and godly leadership in government. Isn't that Oh, please. Great? Which God? <laughs> <laughs> Which God? Which yes. God? Um, well, you know, talking about churches and being so sweet and all of that, you know, the, uh, Catholic, there's a Catholic church in uh, cathedral in San Francisco uh, that uh, recently came, you know, was exposed that they were, ha they were putting the sprinklers 30 feet above the, do the entrance doors to, so when homeless people went to sleep at the door of the church at night, they would spray them with water and soak them uh, with uh, you know, all their belongings and all their things. And uh, you know, this is sort of the charitable thing to do. They, after they were exposed, they were told that uh, they uh, had a, um, that they were going to stop doing it. So mm -hmm. God didn't tell them, you know, it was done. So I thought that that was pretty nasty, you know, yeah, them to do it because, you know, but, you know, we've, the Catholic Church has done one or two things before that are not too, too great. Okay. All right, we've got a couple more minutes. Uh, so, any other news? Yes, one other piece of news uh, on the legislative side. In Michigan, HB 4188, the House passed it, and this would prevent the state or federal government from cutting funds to private adoption agencies. Um, so, what this means is basically um, an, an adoption agency has a full license to discriminate based on sexual orientation, uh, religion, sex, whatever, um, and at the same time be receiving government funding. Uh, so this is taxpayer do dollars being funneled to agencies that are allowed to discriminate and are completely exempt from any federal or state non-discrimination laws, um, which is terrible. Um, <laughs> well, you know, it, a lot of these things uh, are, they, people are thinking Christi Christianity because that's the prevalent, but then here comes the satanic church and all of a sudden they are able to see things the other way, like it right. happened in Florida. So I'm sure this will get turned around once the satanic church decides that they want to take advantage of that. Maybe so. So we'll um, see. But uh, just keep in mind that this this is something that we really should expect to see in more states. Um, these kind of uh, laws that give agencies and employers and businesses the license to discriminate ever since the Hobby Lobby decision last summer, uh, which basically gave uh, employers a... You Where know, corporations are people. Yes. Okay, well, crazy as always. Uh, so I think we're going to go in a, in a short break. Uh, we're going to do some news, and then uh, we'll come back and uh, maybe do a little bit more of our own news and uh, bring in our guests. So stay tuned. Pope Pius VII, who served from March 12, 1939, until his death on October 9, 1958, was dubbed Hitler's Pope in a 1999 book by British journalist John Cornwell, which represents the low point of opinion on the man. Even before the book, Pius VII had been criticized as being too cooperative with the Nazi regime by some, even though the Catholic Church and its leaders were persecuted by the Nazis throughout their time in power. Hitler is said to have thought his goals could only be achieved by obtaining a temporary peace with the Catholic Church and Pius VII tempered open criticisms of the Nazis and adhered to the Vatican's official neutral status during the war. A new Italian film, Shades of Truth, attempts to rescue Pius VII's reputation by a fictionalized account of a journalist's study of records in Israel and Europe. The film's director says that the Pope's diplomatic approach may have saved as many as 800,000 Jews. The movie has been panned by both Catholics and Jews alike for playing loose with the facts, as fictionalized accounts often do. Ironically, the criticism of some Catholics for the movie is that the fiction scenes of the movie are likely to tarnish Pius's reputation even further. Still, Pope Francis has defended Pope Pius on grounds similar to those made in the movie, namely that Pius wanted to avoid retribution that might have befallen both Catholics and Jews in occupied countries. Instead, he worked behind the scenes to do as much as he thought he could get away with. A more equitable treatment of the subject probably remains the 2002 book Pius VII and the Holocaust, Understanding the Controversy by Jose M. Sanchez. The world may not learn the full story, though until the Vatican releases all its archives of the era, a move that seems long overdue. <laughs> Yeah. 
Welcome back to uh, Skeptic's Guide to the 21st Century. Um, we're going to set the stage uh, with a few statistics kind of lead into our topic. Um, so right now in Latin America, a total of 8% <coughs> of the population is unaffiliated compared to the U.S. total. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, compared to the total of U.S. Hispanics, uh, which is 18% unaffiliated. Um, and estimates according to uh, Pew, um, the Research Institute, um, show that only two places um, in South South and Central America have double-digit declines in Catholic identity between 1910 and 1970, and those are the two places that we'll be covering today. In Chile, uh, between 1910 and 1970, uh, there was a 20% decline in Catholic identity, and in Puerto Rico, that was 13%. Uh, but before we go too much into that topic, uh, David is going to be explaining to us um, the difference between the terms Latino and Hispanic. So we, we see the term Latino and Hispanic being uh, thrown out a lot uh, and interchangeably among Latinos among people, among the government, and all of that. So I wanted to explain real quickly what that exactly means so we all know what we're talking about. When you talk about Hispanic, it really refers to a language, uh, while Latino refers to a geography. So with Hispanic, uh, if you and your ancestry uh, come from a country that uh, speaks Spanish, then that's considered Hispanic, which means that Haiti and Brazil and Belize uh, are excluded. But but uh, if someone is Latino or calls them Latino, you know, the, the right term is that that person comes from Latin America, basically everything south from Mexico to the South Pole. So that whole hemisphere includes Brazil, it includes Haiti, uh, and other Romance language <laughs> like that, you know, and so that's, that's really the difference. Now, there have been some times uh, in Mexico some movement where some of the natives have said, look, those are actually white terms, and so it doesn't really apply to us. We're, we're we're Native Americans, and uh, and so we really don't want to be kept called Latinos or Hispanic. Now that, of course, is only in the United States that we refer to it that way. In the rest of the of the world, and the rest, of, you know, Mexico, no one calls itself, you know, a Latino or you know, just we're all Mexicans, we're all people. And and really, the only place that we see that is here, and, and maybe perhaps Canada. But uh, again, it's because you know they. Now, let me ask you a question: Why should we care about Latin America? Why should we care about Latin America? Um, well, specifically, why should we care about Latin America and, and the unaffiliated and, and how the religious trends are? Um, well, first of all, I mean, we have, we have an influence, uh, you know, regardless, regardless of whether they like it or not, the U.S. culture has an influence on Central and South America. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will get more into this later in the show, but more and more people, um, while they're becoming unaffiliated, there is also a trend of uh, people uh, converting from Catholicism to Protestantism, often from uh, Protestants uh, missionaries coming from the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and interestingly enough, uh, those people um, the, who identify as Protestant tend to be more conservative socially than the Catholics. And that, so that's, that's uh, you know... The impact. Yeah, the, that's the kind of the impact. Yeah. And then beyond that, I mean, we're secular, we're atheists, but we're also, many of us, humanists. Yes. And we care about reason, we care about um, reaching the greatest uh, potential Critical for our thinking humans. skill. Yeah, you know. and that, that is beyond borders. You yeah. know, we should care and, about and, it. And, and it does have an effect, that we've, we've seen it here in the United States, where religion has had an effect on science. I mean, you remember when Bush was president, and because of his religi religiosity, uh, we is, uh, the stem cell research, embryonic stem cell research, was put on hold for eight years uh, because he believed that uh, the 100 and literally 180 cells that made up that uh, that a zygote that that had a soul mm -hmm. and so uh, yes you're right the conservatism that that uh, ev the evangelicals bring to Latin America they're going to start seeing that effect as the numbers decline in the Catholic Church mm -hmm. uh, the Catholic Church in general has been uh, uh, very accommodating so when when in Haiti for instance they allow the people to practice voodoo in, in the Catholic Church and you know as long as they show up on Sunday they donate and they call themselves Catholic that's pretty good uh, and so they are able to survive you know the, these things and with time they got nothing but time to reconvert them and put them in the straightened path but fairly often uh, they adapt to what what's going on so I, I think that most Catholics in Latin America and that was my own experience I, I thought I was a good Catholic but really most Catholics tend to be bad Catholics in the sense that they uh, go to they fear they, they go they feel that if they go to mass on Sunday is good enough if you kneel down get up you know 
good enough if you have the sacraments, the baptism, the marriage, that kind of stuff. But for the most part, if you ask people in the street, why can't a priest get married? Most people don't know the, the story behind that or why they can't do that. Or, you know, do you really believe that, that the host changes into the literal, the church says, the literal body of Christ? But if someone were to take a host and find a toenail on it, I'm sure they'll spit it out. You know, if they drink the wine and, and, and it doesn't taste like wine and it's actually literal blood, they will spit it out. And they're not going to say, oh, the beautiful blood of Jesus. No. So that's the, what I'm saying is that the church says is the literal thing. Most people feel, eh, I think it's symbolic. And so we'll just go with symbolic. And so a lot of people are adaptive in that sense. Mm -hmm. So you're right. I think there's a big effect. There's you know, a weird effect that it's going to have in laws such as same-sex marriage, some mm -hmm. such as abortion, mm -hmm. and things like that. Fortunately, we're not quite there yet. So Right. But it's interesting that so the people who are unaffiliated in general, but also in Latin America, according to Pew, tend to be much more liberal and supportive of social issues like same-sex marriage, uh, access to contraception, abortion, divorce, drinking alcohol, and things like that. Um, and we've seen in countries like Chile that same-sex marriage has been legalized, which is uh, we're far ahead of where we are. Yes. Um, so and we should definitely care about so, the yeah, rise we'll of bring in Puerto Rico this past week. So our, we're going to bring that up with our guests because uh, we're hoping that that's the way the rest of the the rest of the uh, Latin America goes. Now, of course, there are 56 million Hispanics in the United States mm -hmm. who are in great constant touch with Latin America, and so there's there is that uh, shift of culture going back and forth. Uh, I have uh, a dozen nieces and nephews born here in the United States in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, who, when you ask them, uh, you know, so what are you? Oh, I'm Colombian, mm -hmm. and oh, really, we're from Medellin, even though they've you know, they were born in Pawtucket, you know, General Hospital in, in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. So there's this affinity that will continue for a long time, considering the numbers. And so that will influence back and forth, right. you know, and uh, we're hoping that as, you know, the inroads are being made by the Mormons, by the Pentecostals, that that's not going to interfere too much in the progress that is being made currently in, uh, uh, in the social issues. That's right. So, um, well, let's, uh, one more thing before we go to our, our first guest. Um, the, uh, what do you think, do you think that the, and this is just your opinion, do you think that the uh, Catholic Church problems with pedophiles, with uh, the, uh, the problems that they've had uh, with uh, not providing the same jumping joy that a lot of the evangelicals provide, you think that's had an effect in Latin America, or you think that's, you know, across the churches growing in other places, and this just happens to be. I mean, I'm, I'm hesitant to say without having, you know, I'm an evidence-based person, so unless I have the facts uh, about what I like the way you, the, you think. know these people said about why they converted, but I, I think generally worldwide, the scandal of the Catholic Church has turned a lot of people away from the church, um, and I, I don't think it's anything new that evangelical mi missionaries just have Take a lot of success. Of <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. I mean, I think they're very good at, at finding converts. Yes, and again is because when they bring in their Bible quotes and say, hey, here it is, and the Catholics really are not prepared to rebuttal those things. Uh, in the Catholic Church, as I was growing up, it was a it's blind faith on the church itself also. So, in fact, the church even today will tell people not to read the Bible on their own, to just you know, read the Bible with the priest. Mm -hmm. And it was 1968, I believe, 68, 69, when uh, Vatican II, for the first time, allowed Catholics to read the Bible in their own language. Mm -hmm. I mean, my parents were already in their late, tw in late 20s when, when that was uh, uh, the case. And that was so, their first time. That was the first time they ever saw the Bible written in, in Spanish. Mm -hmm. So that is, uh, so that, yeah, there's a big, uh, you know, the Catholic Church goes back and forth. A lot of uh, Latin American priests come over here, mm -hmm. and a lot of priests go over there, and so there's that exchange. But there's certainly a big Mormon movement in Latin America, Pentecostals and Evangelicals that are taking advantage of the of the problems that the Catholic Church has been having, mm -hmm. and it's no accident that uh, that for the first time in the history of the Catholic Church we have a, a Hispanic or a Latin American uh, pope. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Catholic Church, the numbers show they're bleeding members like crazy, mm -hmm. and so they're trying to stem it. And I think they picked a guy who's pretty good. He's very charming. He's uh, he backs pedals pretty good. Mm -hmm. He says one thing, and then you know the Vatican comes and corrects him. You know, mm -hmm. so he's yeah. you can see there's a little bit of a, a push in there, and there are a lot of and we'll talk. 
talked about some of the numbers, how uh, there are some people that, uh, even non-believers that like him. Right. So do you think it was a strategic uh, decision? Absolutely. To Absolutely. So uh, they didn't pick one in Africa because they're grown in Africa. Mm -hmm. The Catholic Church is grown in Africa. And right. they were thinking about picking somebody in China, but the Catholic Church in China broke off mm. uh, You know, uh, when the elections were going on or shortly before. So that was the problem, you know? We have... Uh, that, that was the thing. So anyway, I think uh, we're going to go uh, uh, sh on a, should we go on a break or? Uh, I'm not yeah, sure. let's go on a quick uh, break and uh, we'll oh, No, we're going to, I'm sorry, we're going to go with the first, let's go with the first guest. So we have Arturo Ruiz, uh, who is a uh, 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 activist, uh, has been an activist here in the United States and uh, is currently uh, doing his second master's degree in Santiago, Chile. And so this is directly from, from Chile. Chile, welcome to the show, uh, Arturo. Oh, hello. Uh, thanks for inviting me here, and nice to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, you've been hearing what we've been saying uh, about Latin America. What is your take uh, on, on some of the things that we've said today so far? Well, it's true that there are more atheists and more agnostic people here. But also the evangelistical movement and the Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons are growing in a, in a, in a not very good way. So you know, the, the Catholic Church is something like very rational. You obey, but you don't do what they say. You know what I mean? <laughs> so they say you don't use contraception. You say, okay, we don't, but you do. <laughs> but with these people, they are more like uh, strict in that kind of area. So they are very conservative. And they are, and now some people of uh, high income, so with more representation, are getting into into those churches. Hmm. Okay. So, go ahead. Yeah. So I, I'm I'm curious about what the appeal is to these more the stricter groups. I mean, isn't it better to have a, a system where you get everything you want out of your faith, but you don't really have to play by the rules quite as much? Do you think maybe the people that the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons are attracting were maybe the people who are looking for that kind of strict lifestyle? What, what is the appeal? Well, the, I think the appeal is that they tell you what to do and what to think mm. uh, in a very strict way. And the Catholic Church, uh, doesn't do that. They, they say you have to think something like this, something like that. But uh, uh, everything is a mystery, you have to pray, and, and they don't say much much more things to the people. Uh, but these, these pastors are saying you have to hate these people, you have to love these other people. Mm. Uh, there is a pastor here called Pastor Soto. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Soto is his last name. And he's against same-sex marriage, against homosexuality, and it's very, very funny because he's against uh, gender identity. So he doesn't actually understand the concept of gender identity, well, of gender I identity. But <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> yes. Now, with with the, uh, uh, I think it's important to note for our audience that Chile has a very, it's a very secular country, but it also has a precedent that is very secular. Uh, Michelle Bachelet, right? Is yeah. she, is well, she, is she uh, how would you consider her, or how do people see her? Well, uh, now she's having a difficult time because her son did something very wrong <laughs> with some influencers and made a very a billion, a billion uh, business here and people is not happy, but people love her anyway. Uh, she's but, like a big mother but, and she's agnostic. Okay. She's agnostic. That okay. was, uh, yeah, that's and was she, <laughs> when she first ran for president, was she openly agnostic? Yeah, well, uh, here in Chile, Presidents and politicians in general are not supposed to talk too much about their beliefs, you know? Wow. They say, oh, well, I'm a Catholic or I am a, a secular person and that's it. You know, they, we don't they, debate they, about religion. The, the way it's supposed to be here, but never happens. Yeah, we're laughing because that takes on such a... That's so important to so many Americans, and that's why... And they uh, vote I, that way. Yeah, they, they might even vote that way. I mean, uh, year after year, there's a poll done on uh, who would you uh, vote for president, and it goes by religion. You know, would you vote for Muslim? Would a you Catholic. Vote for or a Catholic, and also the LGBT. And atheists are, are at the bottom, uh, just, I think, above Muslims by one percentage point. Yeah. But and I... It, Actually, without 9-11, we used to be at the bottom. Right. Yeah. So it, it's funny. I mean, it, it's it's kind of, we take it for granted that that's a part of our elections, but it's it's interesting to hear that it's not even really a big thing in Chile. Yeah. Now, that, well, it, 
in the right wing parties they are more religious more catholic but even then they, they, they don't talk about that except when they talk about abortion or same-sex marriage or things like that but 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 we don't talk too much about religion and politics now in a lot in a lot of places there is here in the united states there's a big gap in the religiosity of, of young people say people from age 20 to 30 versus you know the older people uh is that the same in chile or is it pretty much even across the board well uh, older people i mean people over 60 they they used to be religious but uh, younger people uh, low than 60s is across you know do you you have an atheist you know, of, by, uh, of 30 years or 40 years and they meet together and but it's not a big deal you know what i mean it's, it's not that if you're an atheist here you will not be i don't know call for your your job or fire or something like that so uh, the, the thing the thing here is you have to respect what other people believe if you if, if i say i'm an atheist it's, it's all right but yes but if i say religion is stupid that's not good you know what i mean yeah uh, now do they criticize other religions like uh, islam and, and isis with the killings you know in the name of their religion uh it, does that do, uh, because i i would imagine that the muslim population in chile is not terribly high compared to christians well not but we have a uh, the, the the big the biggest uh, Palestinian colony here, you know. So Palestinian here, uh, they turn to go with the Palestinian coast. We have a football team called Palestino, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. So uh, and the thing about the Muslim thi the Muslim people uh, is uh, also cross with the the support to Palestine. So that oh, okay. is. Uh, they don't criticize too much the Islam. There are there are some mosquitoes here, and some people is uh, Muslim, but. I don't know. It's, it's not an issue yet here. And is, uh, can you talk about some of the groups, this, the the, uh, the non-believer groups that Chile has? Are there any groups that uh, encourage atheists, agnostics, and non-believers to to join and, and be part of you know society of some sort? Well, yeah, there is a H. It's called Asociación Escéptica de Chile, the Skeptics Association of Chile, uh, Sociedad Atea. Uh, Atheist Society, uh, there is a place called Ilaira Institute for Reason and Free Thinking, you know, <laughs> and Freemasonry, not uh, also also in its principles, gets the laicism or secularism as a, a one of the mandatory things. So separation between church and state. Uh, many presidents of Chile has been Masons. Yeah, including, uh, unfortunately, including. Uh uh, Pinochet <laughs> and, and also Allende. And Allende. So they were both they were both, uh, both. brothers when yeah. uh, when when one took over the other over the other. Uh, but so you're saying that Freemasonry, like in France, uh, plays a role in in the separation of church and state. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very important. The separation of church and state was in 1925 by the president Arturo Alessandri and. Uh, he was a Freemason. <laughs> why is that? Why is why do the Freemasons have such a? Why is separation of church and state so important to them? Why do they play such a role in that? Well, because uh, we believe in free thinking, and uh, if you believe in free thinking, you don't you don't want to be saying what do you what do you have to believe. And the problem is here in Chile, for, uh, in, in the old times when we were part of Spain. The church was uh, was uh, had enormous power, and it was against the independence. You know, so the the way to to take the the church from from politics was the separation of church and state. So I, I think we're running out of time. So uh, I'd like to uh, ask one last question, uh, and it has to do with. Uh, the future of secularism in Chile. Do you see, we got about three minutes, so do you see uh, Chile becoming more secular, same or, or changing in any way? Well, I, I see Chile becoming more radical because before there was these atheist people that, well, I am atheist and I don't care about Catholics, 
But now there are these evangelical people that are very, very activist, and if, and if you if you want to have your freedom, you have to fight them. You know, these people are really even dangerous. I think we may have. From, okay, from and do you feel that's radicalizing the the atheist movement, or just it? Well, there was, here there was not a, an atheist movement, now it is, but uh, the, the atheist movement here is not radical, I think it's just rational. But the irrationalism of these evangelical Jehovah Witnesses and other uh, cults, because they are cults, uh, is, is a problem for this country. It may be a, a danger in the future. Uh, is there a problem with, um, do you have a problem with, uh, with uh, superstitions and uh, other forms of magical <laughs> beliefs that are not religion necessarily, but, uh, you know, uh, does Chile fall a lot into that or not? Well, yeah, but it's kind of uh, like part, of, part of the folklore here, you know, people uh, ask, uh, read tarot cards and they go to witches and a lot of things. But that is not seen as a problem. We are we are still believing in evolution, <laughs> you know, that we're still alive here. <laughs> All right. Well, that's good to hear. <laughs> we're not quite there yet here in the we're, U.S. <laughs> we're, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Well, uh, thank you so much, Arturo, for, for uh, being on the show today. It's a pleasure. Uh, uh, one, oh, one question. Are you coming to the recent rally next year? I don't know. I hope. I, will, I hope I will. Oh, yeah. I, that's not what I want to hear. I want to hear yes. <laughs> I want to hear yes, and I want to hear you coming. Well, it cut. depends, because I have some plans for the next year, and if that, those plans are successful, I may probably don't go. Uh, just <laughs> you know a, what I mean? Just a quick weekend. Yeah. You know, Chileans can come to the U.S. Uh, without a visa. I mean, they're just, yeah. they can just fly in any time. Oh, great. So, All right. can, so, so he has no, no excuse. <laughs> <laughs> no excuse. All right. Well, Maybe well, thank you. Maybe it will. Maybe it will. I think it will. Yeah. All right. Th yeah, thank you so much, guess. Arturo. Thank Until you. next time. Oh, thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 So uh, that was that was great. Uh, you know, it's it's good to see that fairly often here in the United States we think of South America as you know this third world country with their cows roaming down the streets and pigs <laughs> and things like that. But Chile is actually a very sophisticated society. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm still so amazed that he's just like, oh, you know, we don't really talk about religion during our elections. It's like it's so the opposite of here. Wouldn't we love to have that over here? Yeah, Where I wish it was just religion would just be no, not a problem, not a thing it would just be wonderful if you know because really a lot of politicians that's what they do they play to the audience they play to the uh, the uh, the you know the religious people and I figured hey we got all these people here their votes I'll say whatever they want and I'll follow whatever they want and then of course you have the Koch brothers and some of these big corporations mm -hmm. that are pressing their own stuff right on top of it so money talks as they say right and what's funny is we've had a secular constitution for much longer than Chile has yes. so Chile's uh, constitution uh, there was a part written into it that separated church and state in 1925 but our original constitution has a very clear separation of church and state um, but we are clearly very very far behind yeah well, so in, in a few seconds, we're going to go to a PSA, and, uh, but, uh, you know, we're going to have uh, the next person is an activist from Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Puerto Rico is the other place that uh, we were talking about where uh, secularism uh, had grown to uh, in, in double digits from the 1920s. Well, actually, it was a specifically a decline in Catholic the, identity I'm sorry, in the double digits. Let me rephrase mm -hmm. that, yes. And, and, that ex and, and that's a great point because it doesn't mean that atheism rose. Mm -hmm. It just means that they left the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And there is, and we'll, we'll ask our next uh, guest uh, about it, but there is a, a, a recent trip that I had in Puerto Rico. I had never seen so many churches, uh, what they call Christian churches, that are all over the place in everywhere. And these are big, not, not Catholic churches, that are offering all kinds of services for people and, and trying to hook him, hook him in. So I right. think the Catholic, a lot of people migrated to these more conservative churches mm -hmm. uh, to the point that a few weeks ago, uh, I was uh, uh, someone that I know was took photographs in the road in one of the towns where the people driving by were being stopped by the police uh, who would ask if they wanted to pray together. So this is the authorities. This is the police department stopping people for no other reason than religious reason, using government resources wow. to, to do that. Yeah. So it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. We'll, we'll ask our guest uh, more about that when we bring him on. All right. Um, 
I'm not sure if we're going to go to a PSA. Uh, and I'm good. I'm good. Oh, I Marty, stop it. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. It reminds me. I've been thinking uh, maybe we should try a new form of birth control. I heard about this one. It's called the IUD, intrauterine device. Or we could try the patch on your arm. Actually, I think that one goes on your butt. Bedsider.org has birth control information and a lot more. And it's... What do you think, though? Arm of the butt. There's a lot of tree branches and dry brush over here. We should probably move the bonfire over there. I'm guessing Smokey liked that idea. This is Richard Dawkins. Doing commercials is unfamiliar territory for me, but I'm inviting you to watch Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century, on Fairfax Public Access every Sunday. Each week the hosts tackle wishful thinking, religion, pseudoscience and the harm they cause with a combination of facts, humour and community involvement. They challenge believers to defend their faith and give you, the skeptic, a voice. With live call-ins for viewers and streaming on the World Wide Web, there's never a dull moment. Don't wait. Look at them now on Facebook and YouTube. And remember to watch Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century. Or there'll be hell to pay. Body language can tell you all sorts of things. Like someone is having a stroke. Know the sudden signs. Learn fast. Face drooping. Arm weakness. Speech difficulty. Time to call 911 and get them to a hospital immediately. Learn the body language and spot a stroke fast. Hi. May I please have an application? Thank you. Skip the drama. Get your diploma. Okay. Take that first step towards a better future. Find free adult education classes at finishyourdiploma.org. Welcome back. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's just me, but I love those PSAs. <laughs> They're great. <laughs> They're very good. <laughs> so especially every time I see a new one that, I've, that I haven't seen, it's like, oh, wonderful. I, I, I like those. So I'm glad we have them. Now, we, we're, you know, we're running short on time, so we want to make sure we bring in our next guest without much ado, and that's Toyin Sola. And he is from Puerto Rico, and he's an activist there. Uh, and so uh, welcome uh, to our show, Toyin Sola. Can you hear us? I can hear you perfectly, David. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, and uh, we got a lot to talk about, so we're going to try to squeeze in as much as possible. And uh, please uh, jump in to say something if we're missing something important that we need to point out. Mm -hmm. uh, let's start with, with uh, Puerto Rico and, and its history of secularism and, you know, what, is, what are the rules there? I, I, well, Let's start uh, with that. It starts in 1953. Uh, it's, uh, secularism is enshrined in our constitution. And I'll actually uh, go as far to say that it's uh, even uh, more enshrined in ours than in the United States because it says explicitly, Article uh, 2, Section 3, that there shall be complete separation between the church and the state. Uh, so, in theory, that's what we see. Uh, in practice, it's uh, it's completely different. Huh. What is it like in practice? Well, in practice, uh, for example, uh, this week, I woke up to the joy of opening my newspaper and seeing a full-page ad from my mayor endorsing with his signature uh, a campaign called 40 Days of Fasting and Humiliation because for some reason, our mayor believes that uh, Getting together and humiliating yourself before God is a way of resolving the actual problems that we face day to day. Wow. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> uh, now, 
uh, Puerto Rico, just to, to, for our audience, and you know, we want to make sure there's no misunderstanding, Puerto Rico is part of the United States, and every person in Puerto Rico is a U.S. citizen by birth. And so the U.S. Constitution applies in Puerto Rico as well as it does here in, in Northern Virginia, right? Right. Yes. Um, and I wanted to ask, because the date, 1953, kind of struck me because that's actually just a year before um, in God we trust, uh, sorry, under God was added to the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, in the middle of the Red Scare in the United States. So it's kind of interesting timing that right as um, the United States was going through this kind of hysteria, Yes. Uh, you know, against the godless communists that in Puerto Rico, you all of a sudden have secularism enshrined in your constitution. Can you talk about a little bit about what was going on at the time? Well, uh, it is my belief that what was happening was that uh, the evangelical uh, churches were afraid of being persecuted by the state, and they put a lot of pressure on the uh, fathers of our constitution, and eventually they they ceded and. That, that's pretty much uh, what, what made, uh, made it so explicit. But of course, it was just a matter of parsing it with words. Uh, in practice, it's completely different. Right. So is, it, do you, would you say that atheism or secularism, well, let's, let's define this stuff. Do you think the non-belief in Puerto Rico today, is it, uh, is it, is it going, getting better, is it getting worse, or is it being the same? I think it's getting better, uh, slowly better, but I think it's going to get progressively uh, better. Uh, uh, five, six years ago, it would have been unthinkable for me to open up my Facebook uh, newsfeed and see so many um, notices from people I know and I've actually shared with uh, skepticism towards the government, towards uh, the people here in Puerto Rico that call themselves uh, apostles. Uh, just uh, every day you see a constant uh, criticism of, these, of, of, the, of this marriage between state and, uh, and the church here in Puerto mm -hmm. Rico. And can you actually tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you got involved in uh, the secular and atheist movement in Puerto Rico? What groups you're involved Absolutely. with? Absolutely. Well, I, I was raised in a very secular way. I was very lucky. Um, my father and my, my family, they never made me go to any church. I was never baptized. Um, whenever I had any questions about it, they would gladly oblige. But really, it was uh, religion was not such a big issue in my family, thankfully. And when I entered the, uh, the army, when I was 19 years old, um, I actually, you know, uh, uh, dared to say that I was an atheist. Uh, was my uh, fellow partners and uh, out of negative pushback because of it. Um, after I got out, I went to the university. And just um, those lectures, the professors, they uh, really, really open up my eyes uh, and see that the uh, best state is the state with, uh, with no church intermission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting that you had so, such blowback in the military. Um, there's actually an entire organization, actually two, dedicated to uh, serving uh, atheists in the military. There's the Military Atheists and Freethinkers, and then there's the Military Religious Freedom uh, Foundation. Um, and there's actually a saying in the military, there's no atheists in foxholes, uh, which is uh, terribly discriminatory. Um, so could you actually speak a little more to the discrimination you faced while you were in the military? Well, I mean, it was just strange. I mean, uh, of course, when, when you're um, sharing with, with uh, people, you know, that were like me, 18, 19, just out of high school, they never faced other ideas out in the world. You put all those uh, people together, and for a lot of people, they just could not, they, uh, a lot of my friends, they just could not understand how anybody could not believe in God. Mm -hmm. It was simply unthinkable uh, to them, and sadly, they were not tolerant about it. A lot of them, some were. And you know it is what it is. Uh, it, it really hardened my my uh, my position mm -hmm. on my atheism, and you know uh, ultimately made me better. And did you get any blowback from your superiors and the people in charge? Absolutely not. No, absolutely not. Uh, not not from my uh, sergeants or, uh, or or commanding officers. Absolutely not. It was all. Now on nice. sun on Sundays when everyone is going to church to different churches, what did you do? <laughs> Actually, uh, I find, find this amusing. Uh, me and, and other friends, we used to go to the Jewish service uh, because after the service, they would give us, they would give us uh, sweets and cakes. And 
on basic training this is uh, uh, unthinkable. I'll so, convert for food. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was good in that, in that respect. Oh, you know, that, you know it, that's why a lot of uh, Christian churches offer the coffee and donuts afterwards. It's ah. that reward. It's, I remember when I was a religious guy looking forward to the... Uh, now I think the price is too high. <laughs> <laughs> Some donuts and stuff. Um, so going back to religiosity in Puerto Rico, um, what... It, are things changing in Puerto Rico? Uh, what about um, general acceptance for gay marriage, um, for you know contraception, abortion, things like that? And how does that play into the rise of uh, non-believers? Well, uh, contraception is not really a, a big uh, issue here. Uh, abortion is practiced legally, and it's really not a, not a thing. But regarding the gay marriage, uh, just this uh, two days ago, March twentieth. Uh, we had uh, the governor of Puerto Rico and the, the, the government of Puerto Rico formally announce their um, withdrawal from supporting the discriminatory civil code of Puerto Rico, uh, 68 actually, that says that explicitly marriage is between one man and one woman because it got challenged in the court just as it's been done throughout the United States. Uh, the governor uh, is personally opposed because of religious reasons to this. But ultimately, I believe he made the political decision that it's better that I withdraw now before the Boston Circuit Court uh, formally uh, says that it's unconstitutional. So let me just say that uh, we're not going to defend this part. But now it remains to be seen whether they will actually uh, uh, you know, change the legislation to say to, with, to withdraw that it says explicitly that it's between one man and one woman. It remains to be seen whether they will do that, but I believe that they're just waiting for the Supreme Court uh, at the end of their to make a decision. Terms. And uh, well, where it's uh, widely expected that it will be finally, um, uh, it will finally reverse in all United States, and then they can just say, you know what, we really have nothing to do with this, you know, just. Uh, now, so it's politically toxic to say that you support uh, gay marriage in Puerto Rico. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, uh, changing topics a little bit. August of this year, uh, in Puerto Rico, they're going to have the first atheist convention ever that is being yes. sponsored by American Atheists. Absolutely. Uh, American Atheists with partnership with Humanistas Seculares de Puerto Rico, which I'm a proud member of. Uh, we will be hosting this uh, uh, August 21, 23. We're going to have uh, speakers like Matt DeLahanty, uh, Richard Carrier, and really, uh, I, I really want our friend Arturo from Chile to come. <laughs> I want her from Latin America to uh, really, really make the effort. It's going to be a great event. I want everybody in the United States to come here during the day, uh, look at the speed, uh, listen to the speakers uh, at night, uh, enjoy the, the nice, uh, you know, just incredibly. Uh, the warmth of the Amer of the Puerto Rican people, <laughs> <laughs> to put it to put it in the, in those terms, and uh, I understand Puerto Rico also enjoys uh, some uh, something called rum. Uh, never heard of it. Oh much. yes, uh, we got the best rum in the world. <laughs> yeah, Very humble also. Yeah. Come enjoy this with us. So uh, so it's going to be a great conference. So the conference is going to be in in English for the most part, but there there are going to be some things in Spanish. Yes, and then awesome. then you, you've heard me mention before that we have recent rally next year. Now, I understand from some people in Puerto Rico, there's going to be a big group of people try, that are going to try to make it to Washington, D.C. next year also. So uh, I think it's going to be a great exchange between um, the secular people in both sides. Are you coming? Are you coming? I'm definitely going there, and I hope to see you there. Oh, so you, you won't be able to get rid of me. <laughs> we'll be here. No, the, the nice thing about it is that Reason, uh, Road to Reason, the TV show here, is going to be covering the event over there, and so there's going to be a lot of filming there. We'll be interviewing people all over. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, I mean, it was really good last time. This time it's going to be even better. Okay. Um, I do really quick, you, you mentioned your group, and I want to make sure any uh, English speakers watching the show uh, know the group you're part of. It's a Secular Humanist of Puerto Rico if you'd like to look yes. them up um, and I also wanted to ask you um, some questions about um, evangelicals in Puerto Rico because we just were talking to Arturo mm -hmm. from Chile and he was saying that there's a very much a rise in um, a conversion to uh, evangelical Christianity so uh, what is it looking like in Puerto Rico well it's uh, I would say it's about the same 
And you see that a lot of people are shying away from, as uh, David mentioned, to you that, that question earlier about the, all the scandals surrounding the Catholic Church. A lot of these members are, are just running away in droves, and some of them are, uh, are falling into the evangelical uh, religion, but a lot of them are just uh, going from, from being Catholics to just completely apathetic to the... Nuns, becoming the nuns. Yes. Nuns, yes, exactly, becoming nuns, yes. So you think more people are, are just kind of getting turned off from religion in general than joining the evangelicals? Well, I, would, I, I, I don't have the, the, the numbers to sustain my arguments, but I do believe that some of them are going to the evangelicals and some of them are just shying away from religion altogether. And, and that's one of the problems with the nuns tends to be that they, that doesn't mean they become atheist or agnostic. That just means they're either fed up with the church, they still believe in God, they still believe in, in, in supreme being and, and the, super, the supernatural stuff. And so spiritual they, is not religion. <laughs> exactly. but, but the way I see it is I think it makes them uh, sort of pr uh, it's a nice fertile ground for future indoctrination from someone that comes in and, and sells them a good argument because they're already primed. They already have that, that belief. I mean, that's, that's just, I guess we'll, we'll have to see and wait if that's the case. Now, <clears throat> has the internet made any impact uh, in, in the secularism movement in Puerto Rico? Has that helped? Has that not? Or what's, what's your take on that? Yes, uh, yeah, yes, just as if, yes, as, uh, yes, like you've seen in the women's rights movements or the immigration movements, the internet has made a, a incredible uh, strides in, 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 in helping people be more aware and wanting to become part of, I, I become, I joined, I, uh, I became a secular activist because of the internet. I, it was last year, Humanitas uh, Seguras de Puerto Rico, they were, uh, they were asking people to join them in a march, uh, uh, fighting you know, discrimination against the LGBTQ community. And I said, you know what, let's go over there. And I went with my girlfriend. She was actually pregnant at that moment. And she marched with me, uh, with, uh, with the people there. And since that day on, I've been a uh, full-on uh, secular activist because uh, the, we, we are really needed right now. Right. Excellent. Uh, do we have uh, about a minute left? Uh, is there any question you want to get off your chest, or otherwise I got like ten thousand other questions? Go ahead. <laughs> uh, has American television had any impact in in, in, in atheists and how atheists are viewed in Puerto Rico, like the show Bones or, or House or some of those? In, in, again, it's there are no numbers Absolutely. for that, as far I've, as I know. I've, uh, I've had several friends of mine uh, made the made the, the, the connection. Oh, you know, uh, I watched it on, on Bones. I watched it on House. You know the. Yeah, I really know it's I like you guys because you know you, you keep it real <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. You know, the, uh, we got about 30 seconds left. Uh, is, uh, the, do you, uh, what's the next step do you see in Puerto Rico in moving forward and trying to secularize the island? Well, the, the, the next step is when, when, when um, same-sex marriage is, uh, is allowed. Uh, this, uh, all, this, all these issues, the, 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 the faster that we um, get them over with, you know, and, become, and, and have them become non-issues, uh, the faster that secularism uh, will ultimately prevail uh, to making it a much better state. Excellent. Thank you so much Thank you for, having for being with us, and we'll be seeing you soon. Thank you, Thank you for, for bringing us that, and you know we'll ask more questions next time we, we get to see you. But All right, uh, David. for now, thank you so much. And thanks for watching.